Timing is interesting. We're preaching through the book of 1 Peter, and today we land on what Peter says about living under government and being Christian citizens. And we have an election on Tuesday. So that's what we're going to consider today. And maybe I'll begin by addressing a desire that many of us have. We wish that elections weren't so nasty. We wish that the candidates were the noble statesmen. As in days of old, when statesmen were decent and upright and campaigns were clean and about the issues. If only we could go back to the good old days with great names like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, dominant in politics. Now, George Washington was our first president. He ran unopposed and served two terms. And then it was a choice between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And wouldn't it be nice if we had candidates like that and campaigns where the press and the media were not so biased? In the 1796 election, supporters of John Adams called Jefferson a howling atheist and a candidate for cutthroats. Jefferson's campaign claimed that Adams would destroy the Constitution, declare himself king, and make his sons crown princes. Adams won the 1796 election, and none of those things happened. So they had a rematch. The 1800 election again matched Adams and Jefferson. Well, this time, Jefferson's supporters invented a tall tale that President Adams had ordered an American warship to bring two mistresses from England for the president's pleasure. The newspapers favoring Adams warned that if Jefferson won, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. Jefferson would burn Bibles and burn churches. Jefferson won, and all the churches were in flames, and all the Bibles were burned. Well, actually, not really. Um, he never did any of those things. But that's what it was like in the good old days. The book of Ecclesiastes says, don't ask, why were the old days better than these? For it's not wise to ask such a question. But if we go back to the good old days one more time, 1804, uh, we have the sitting vice president of the United States gunning down the former president of the treasury in a duel. Don't you wish for more civility in politics like we used to have? Well, if we go back a little further to the old days, we go back to the time 1 Peter was written. And in those old days, they didn't have nasty elections. They didn't have elections. They had emperors. Nice guys like Tiberius, who was the emperor when Jesus was crucified, and who had his own island of little boys for his own pleasure. He had Caligula as a successor, who, among other things, married his sister and his horse. Then there was Nero, who merely burned Christians in gardens for the spectacles and parties that he had. That's what was going to come a few years after Peter wrote uh, these words uh, that we're going to read. That was government in the good old days. Well, what does Peter have to say um, when it comes to having such people in positions of government? Well, you might be surprised, but Peter says that we need to actually submit to those who are in positions of power. We looked at, in kind of an overview message, uh, in a previous message, about how this is divided up. He talks about living under the system. And there's the political system, there's the work system of that time, often involving slavery, and the marriage and family system of that time. And Peter now describes how you live under that system. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires that war against your souls and live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 
That's the overview, and then he goes into the details of living under the system, and today we're going to look at living under the political system, but then also, in a couple of days, we are the political system. We get to call the shots for at least one day. Well, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as to the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Now, in those verses, the, the basic points that Peter makes are very clear. He says that we're to honor God's image and rule in the human creatures who govern. As I've mentioned before, the literal translation isn't actually submit to authorities instituted among men, it's submit to every human creature. And he reminds us that even the authorities are human creatures under God, and we recognize God's image in them, and God's purpose in having some humans in positions of leadership and of rule. He says we need to do this to disprove the ignorant accusations that Christians are ruinous rebels. He doesn't want Christians to be the known as the ones who are going around burning courthouses and who are attacking and trying to bring down governments or who are just eager to smash everything and who want to be known as those who oppose uh, the existing governing system. He wa and Christians were accused of many bad things in those days. He says we need to live as free people. Live freely, but don't say, well, I'm free. I can do whatever I please, no matter how bad it is, no matter how much trouble it causes. Live as free people, but live as servants of God, not to indulge your own evil. A little later he says, you know, if you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. You live freely, but that doesn't mean you're free to be wicked. So part of living under rulers is being law-abiding. Above all, abiding under God's law, and then also abiding under any good laws that are sometimes run by some pretty bad people. And then in the, in the final part of that, Peter says, now, honor everybody. Um, it's translated, show proper respect to everyone, but it's actually just the same word. Uh, when it says, honor the king, the sentence begins with, honor everybody. Honor everybody. Have a special love for the brotherhood the people who are your fellow believers in Christ and belong to the body of Christ. Fear God. Tremble before God. Let God be the one who makes you shake. A little later, Peter says, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. A lot of us go around being scared about this or scared about that. Jesus said, don't even be scared of death. Uh, only fear the one who can destroy body and soul in hell and don't fear anything else. And don't be scared of the emperor either. On to the emperor, but realize that he's not the big shot that everybody makes him out to be. God is the one both to fear and to love and to worship. In those days, you were supposed to worship the emperor. You were supposed to fear the emperor. Peter says, you can honor the emperor, but forget about that fear and worship stuff. That goes to God. So that's the overview of what it means, according to Peter, to live under rulers in a situation where the rulers were often very bad people, but overall there was still a governing system that kept some order and room for some good things to happen. Now, when he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human creature, whether they're the king or the governors, he's echoing something that Jesus himself said. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God, what is God's? So there is a role for government, and government's role is not to be God. It has a God-appointed role. It will answer to God for how it handles that role. So give Caesar what is rightly Caesar's, but give God what is God's. Uh, Jesus was asked to pay the tax. This particular tax was to help cover the funding of the temple, but it was a tax imposed by local authorities. And so Jesus thought he'd use that as a teaching moment. He says, now, Peter, what do you think? When these big shot governors and kings are ruling, do you think they make their kids pay taxes? 
Peter says, no, their kids don't pay any taxes. And Jesus says, yeah, the sons are exempt from taxes, aren't they? And so, uh, technically, as sons of God, uh, living under a different government, we're exempt from taxes, says Jesus. But, so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Man, don't you wish that would happen about every <laughs> April 10? You know, those of you who love fishing, and even some who don't, might go fishing. If you could just solve the tax issue by saying, yeah, I'm going to pull one in. But again, Jesus is making a point that you actually, when you're paying taxes, you're, you're a member of another kingdom. But so as to avoid giving offense, you can still um, pay taxes, um, support the government insofar as it does some good in this or that. But remember always, remember always that you're strangers and aliens here. You're sons of the king. Uh, your citizenship in your own country may be precious to you. It may not be so precious. It may be just something you put up with, like living under a Roman tyrant. Uh, but either way, uh, you live under the king of kings. Paul says much the same thing. He says in Romans 13, verse 1, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. He says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. So submission involves um, just putting up with the government, living under it, obeying it insofar as its commands are right and just, and just always being eager to do what's good, even when the government isn't telling you to do what's good. Be ready to do what's good. If the government favors good, well, do that, of course. And then do a lot of good things the government isn't forcing you to do or requiring you to do. What's right with the government? Well, we are often reminded what's wrong, but let's remember what's right with it is that it's put there by God as his servant to punish evil and to promote good. It promotes order and stability. And the only thing worse than bad government is no government, anarchy, just everybody out for themselves and pillaging each other. So one good thing about government is it prevents hell on earth. But it can't produce heaven on earth. Remember that. Because when you have a government that promises you paradise, a government that will produce heaven on earth, a government that will stop every bug from spreading, a government that will control the climate 50 years into the future, if only you hand over total control to that government, then it controls the bugs. It controls the planets. It controls the sunspots. It controls everything. It controls you is who it controls. So keep that in mind. If you really, really want a paradise where everybody's happy 24-7 and the government is going to provide that happiness and prevent every danger and make sure everybody's equal and everybody's fine, there are governments who have promised such and every time they have enslaved and destroyed. Believe a government that is going to do a little something to prevent hell on earth. When they start sounding like heaven on earth, tune them right out. They're lying. The Bible says, pray for all people, for kings, for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. And it pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's a theme that runs through this whole section in Peter of living under the system. You're trying to win people over to the knowledge of the truth. Your biggest priority is not this or that government. You want all people to be saved like God wants people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so you pray to that end. You pray for everybody. And in particular, you pray for kings and people in authority. And what is your special concern when you pray for kings and those in authority? Their main job, or at least the main thing you want from them as a believer, is that they make space for gospel living. They make space for you to live a peaceful and quiet life. They make space for you to live in godliness and holiness. They don't do it all for you necessarily. Uh, they can't make you holy. They can't make you godly. But they can do a lot of things to make it hard, very, very hard for you to be godly. They can make you 
or they can't make you, but they can threaten to punish you if you don't do wicked things. They can take your money through taxes to pay for wicked things. They can make it hard for the righteous. And so you pray for government that they won't make it so hard for the righteous. Sometimes they will anyway. And then as Peter teaches throughout the whole letter, you're going to have to be able to suffer and suffer with a smile and keep spreading the gospel. But pray, pray, says Paul, that you can live a peaceful and a quiet life in godliness and holiness, that the government will leave you alone. <laughs> Is that too much to ask? Is that too much to pray for? Pray that government will leave you alone to live a peaceful and quiet and godly and holy life. That, you know, that was kind of, that may sound like not much, but throughout a great deal of history, government will not leave the disciples of Jesus alone to live peaceful and quiet lives. And so that's part of our prayers. Lord, just whatever the government's up to, please make room under their rule for God's people to live like God's people without being hunted. Throughout time, things often got a little better than it was under the Caesars. Uh, there have been governments that at least, um, though not perfect, saw some major improvements in governance. And much of that was due to biblical impact, to the influence of Jesus Christ and his followers on ideas of governance. So as we move from the context of Paul and Peter writing in the scriptures and apply it to our own time, we want to think about the situation as it developed throughout history and in which we find ourselves today. Our coins say, in God we trust. Our pledge says that we are one nation under God. The idea of being a nation under God means that the rights of the people are guaranteed not by any politician, but by the Almighty Himself. They mean that that government will answer to God for what it does. And the idea of government under God is one of the most liberating things in the history of humanity. Always these governments have tried to pretend they are God. The ones who proclaim emperors and kings to be divine. Or the dictatorships of modern days who claim to be atheists and have the ten-story high pictures of the dear leader. They don't believe in government under God. And you can tell by the way they rule. Another great principle that has characterized the best of governments is rule of law. Not this guy or that guy gets to determine and decide whatever they want. Or this woman or that woman in a position of governance. Rule of law where laws are made, and then those in positions of executive power apply and enforce the law, but they don't get to make it up as they go. They don't get to say, last week the law was this thing, but this week I decided the law is that thing. That's not how good governance happens. And rule of law is rooted deeply in the Bible. When you read in the book of Deuteronomy, it says the king himself should realize that he's not different or above all the other citizens, that he's not above the law. Instead, the king is supposed to be reading the law regularly to know what the law is so that he can be applying that law. In the Bible, we get the idea of separation of powers. The, the power of the priesthood, for instance, was always separate from the power of the king. And even within government, judges often were not just the kings. And there was a statement in the Bible which later Christians heard and it gave them some ideas about governance. The prophet Isaiah said, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. And they read that and said, The Lord is judge, lawgiver, and king. And he can save we don't want anybody else to have the position of judge and lawgiver and king. Let's separate the powers of the judges from the power of those who make the laws and have that be separate from the executive or the kingly type power. So we've got those three different uh, branches of government, judicial, the judges, uh, lawmaking or legislative, and executive. Let's have them separate so you don't have any one person holding all those powers because we don't trust somebody with that much power. And none of the branches of government 
can save us. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our king. It is he that will save us. Now we'll have three separate branches of government, none of them being savior, and we'll move on from there. The value of each person. The lowest and least in the Bible is treasured by God himself. You read again and again and again that the Lord watches over the alien. The Lord watches over the widow. The Lord watches over the fatherless. The Lord watches over the poor. You don't write anybody off. Everybody counts. And that idea that everybody counts, everybody gets to vote even, um, when they reach an age of understanding, is rooted in the idea that every person matters. And if you have authority, it is authority not just to get richer and richer for yourself or your family, um, and using government power to do that, it's authority to serve. Jesus taught a different model. He said, now the kings and rulers of the pagans want to use their power and they always want to boss people around, but you shouldn't be like that. Instead, the greatest among you is one who serves. And even though the label isn't always true, I still love the label, public servants. Public service is what you do when you're in government. It is an ideal, not always fulfilled by a long shot, but it is an ideal that comes from the Bible. If you hold a big public position, it is to serve others. And the vision of the Bible was also different. The ancient dictatorships did some amazing things. You can still visit the pyramids today. They're still standing. They are impressive. And it is undoubted that thousands of slaves died building those stone monuments to people we don't even care about anymore. Real government has a vision that every man is under his own vine and is own, under his own fig tree with his wife and his family and they have just a little private property. They have a place where they can flourish. They can be who they were meant to be and away with all those stinking pyramids that are built by slaves for the arrogance of the grand poobah on the throne. So these were some of the impacts that the Bible has had in influencing good governance. To one degree or another, various governments have been influenced that where the Christian faith has taken deep roots. Dr. J.I. Packer said that representative democracy as we know it is not the only form of government under which Christian citizens have lived and served God. You can be a Christian under all kinds of different governments and situations and systems, and if that's the system that you're dealing with, then you learn to live under that system, sometimes to suffer under that system. But Dr. Packer goes on to say, however, there's no doubt that from a Christian standpoint, representative democracy is a fitter and wiser form than any other. And so since we have opportunities to try to make the case for better government, then we as Christian citizens don't just have to submit to and live under the system. We have opportunities to have a voice in and make a difference in the system ourselves. Now, what is the purpose of governance? It hasn't changed all that much. To punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. That's kind of supposed to be the basic thing governments do is punish what's wrong and uh, reward or praise those who do what's right. Romans 13 says the same thing as Peter. Do what's right and the leader will command you. But you do, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he doesn't bear the sword for nothing. So it's about punishing wrong and rewarding right. Now, that is very clear cut and very simple. But in real life, governance is not so clear cut and simple. Do you want government to punish everything wrong that is prohibited in God's Ten Commandments? I don't. Do you want the government to try to figure out who's coveting and then hunt them down and imprison them or whip them or punish them in some other way for coveting? You know, the, the question usually with government is, okay, what should it permit and what should it uh, prohibit? What should it promote? Because those are three basic attitudes toward an, a behavior or an action that government can take. It can say, okay, you may not do that. End of story, you do it, you get punished. And the degree of punishment may vary. If it's a really bad thing that's being prohibited, you may get executed. If it's treason or murder. If they think, well, it's something we frown on, you may get a big fine. 
If it's something that's not as bad as murder, but more serious than a frown, uh, then you may be in prison for a while. So you get prohibit, it prohibits and punishes certain kinds of things. Theft, murder, kidnapping, treason. Government also prohibits certain things and says, well, you need to build a building this way, and if you can't pass a building inspection, you don't get your building approved. Um, and it's trying to prohibit certain kinds of dangerous building practices. And, and that can grow and change over time what government prohibits and won't allow. Formerly, many governments would prohibit Sunday commerce so that everybody would have a day off at the same time. Sometimes governments would prohibit blasphemy. They would prohibit divorce, or at least no-fault divorce. If there was a divorce, they would put some work into finding out who was to blame. And if you were the one who bailed out on your spouse, you came out of it in worse shape than the person who was not at fault in the divorce. So the way that government has handled or prohibited or dealt with various things over time um, sometimes varies. And one stance is prohibiting. Another is permitting. You're not approving it. You're not punishing it. But you're just not interfering in the first place. This is sometimes called freedom, where you don't try to make a law against it. You don't say, and taxpayers are going to pay for that. You just say, okay, you do what you want. You do what you want in that area. And so, uh, you know, under some governments, for instance, uh, from a religious and spiritual point of view, blasphemy is a very, very serious offense against God. Unbelief in Jesus Christ is dreadfully serious, rejection of Christ, heresy, maybe terrible, swearing, gossip, rage. These are all things that can de destroy a soul. But they are not necessarily things that government weighs in on and tries to control. There have been, of course, um, governments that try to force one kind of religious belief or practice as compared to another. But not all. They, they permit. And permitting something doesn't mean I approve. It just means I'm not going to mess with you in that area. Sometimes there's permission, but kind of a frown. Like government will permit, it tried to prohibit alcohol. Remember, um, some of you know your history. It tried to prohibit the drinking of all alcohol and the sale of all alcohol. That didn't work very well. So then it tried to do what was the so-called sin tax. We'll make it legal and we are going to get rich off of it. So we will tax the daylights out of alcohol. Same thing with cigarettes. You're paying a little bit for the tobacco and a whole bunch for the sin tax on alcohol. So it's, it's permitted, but government tries to discourage it somewhat. Or I don't think it even tries to discourage it anymore. It just tries to rake in a lot of money from it. Gambling, too, used to be prohibited until government got into the gambling business. Then it permitted it and um, makes a lot of money off of the casinos and off of the lotteries that the government itself runs you, know, it, 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 you always see something shifting when it moves from prohibit, past permit, into promote. When government is running gambling, it has made a major step from the days when it prohibited gambling because it knew that it wrecked a lot of people's financial well-being. So these are tough calls that a government has to make. Um, do we prohibit it? Do we allow it? Do we promote it and, and fund it? Because there are some things that government wants to happen, and so it will pay for them. It thinks education is a good thing, and so it pours a lot and a lot of money into education. Sometimes it's not very good education. Sometimes it may be even anti-Christian education, but it is heavily funded by government because government is, um, you know, it's something government wants to promote. It wants to promote good health. So it may have policies about insuring, or even some governments will fund the health care of all their citizens. So there's a variety of things that, that a government will promote. Now, living in a time such as the one we're in, you know, you could get a little bit of a headache and a little dizzy trying to figure out all the different issues that a government should get involved in or shouldn't and what it ought to do and what it ought not to do. Just looking at those three possibilities, prohibit, permit, and promote, I hope that it clarifies in your mind a little bit that just because you think something is good, do you really want government to enforce it? I want everybody to believe in Jesus. And I don't want them to believe in Jesus or say they do at gunpoint. Because the government wields the power of the sword. Ultimately, it's the sword. You want people to be generous. 
And so you say, I think there should be equality. That means government should take money from those who have more than I think they ought to have and give it to people who have less than I think they ought to have. And that, then that raises kind of the question that once was put to Alexander the Great. He had a pirate um, in custody. And he was talking to that pirate. And, the, and he was scolding that pirate. And the pirate said, well, um, king, you... You consider, because I take one ship and take its goods, you call me a pirate. You take an empi entire empire and call yourself a king. The ability to use power to seize what is someone else's does not always mean that it's the right thing to do. Even if you think wealth ought to be redistributed, there are little things in the Bible such as you shall not steal, which are not always made right by saying, except if you're the government. Now, that doesn't mean the government has no right to tax or no right to do anything in redistribution. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that using government to do any good thing you think ought to have done is often a mistake, even if they are very good things. Focus, I think, on a couple of areas where government, whatever kind it's been throughout history, needs to do at least two things. Protect life and protect property. It's not going to be able to ban all coveting, stop all blasphemy, correct all heresy. But murder is a pretty serious matter. I was um, interacting with somebody the other day who was very offended that anyone would uh, call them pro-abortion when in fact they are only pro-choice. And, uh, or consider them pro-murder. And I said, yes, I, I believe that it's not pro-murder um, to be pro-choice. You're just leaving it to people. Let's say um, there's a person who thinks that everybody ought to be able to shoot people they don't like. It is pro-choice to say, let them shoot people they don't like. It is pro-murder to say, the government will fund the hitman and provide the bullets to shoot people you don't like. So pro-choice says, murder's um, up to you. Pro-murder means, and we will pay for the murders. Now, when we think about the matter of killing babies, if you're pro-choice, you say, the murder is up to you. What are you saying when you say, and we will pay for it too at every stage? Then you have moved, I think, I think killing should be prohibited. Per permitting, that's a disastrous step. Promoting and paying is absolutely horrendous. So when we think about these matters, we do have to get through the lies and the false descriptions of things. To be pro Pilate was pro-choice. He said, I do not favor the killing of Jesus, but I defer to your will on this matter. You kill him if you want to. That's what it means to be pro-choice when it comes to matters of life. Pro-murder means, and I will also throw in my soldiers to handle the execution for you, which Pilate ended up doing. Take another matter. It used to be prohibited to um, engage in homosexual relations. Then it was permitted, and the appeal of people who had that desire was, leave us alone. And then... It was promote, exalt this to the same level as the holy institution of marriage and punish those who even speak against it or refuse to make cakes for celebrations of it. You see the change over a couple of decades from prohibit to permit, to promote, to require anybody who says anything against it to be fired from their positions and to be penalized and punished in other ways. It used to be a crime for a doctor to lop off healthy body parts from somebody. That was prohibited. Then it was permitted to do uh, gender reassignment surgeries, and now the government insists on paying for them. There's one party, in fact, which says, we are going to enshrine in law the rights of people to have their desires paid for by the government. So 
You need to understand that um, although government doesn't enforce everything all the time, you need to discern within your own culture when something has moved swiftly from being prohibited to being permitted to being promoted. And when you have your own uh, responsibilities as a citizen, you say, now is that something that I am going to support? Is that, does it matter if the government allows a certain class of people in my country to be killed? Does that matter? Should I try to resist that where I can? Should I pay for that without um, protest if the government decides it's going to fund that? Those are the kinds of questions that you face as a citizen living in our society today. Now, when we think about what role that we ought to play as citizens, there are a few different uh, approaches that we can take. Dr. J.I. Packer um, identifies some of these in an article that he wrote back in 1985. And so the, these three areas, I haven't worded it exactly as he did, but they follow kind of his uh, way of approaching this. He says there's some Christians who tend to redefine the gospel as social justice and shalom in this present world. They want God's kingdom to come, they want it to come now, and they believe that it can come in this world and through social and political action. The disaster of that, of course, is that um, we're strangers and aliens in the world, and we are not going to achieve paradise right now. And as I've already said, attempts to achieve paradise by these means generally lead to some very calamitous consequences. Another approach is to say, stay out of politics. Avoid social action. Be a godly person, pray, read your Bible, stick to personal piety, evangelism and outreach, and don't get your fingers dirty in politics. That's, that's kind of appealing. And there's something to be said for it. But especially in Peter's day, there'd probably be a lot to be said for it because you didn't have political influence anyway. And you weren't going... So there may be times when that is about the best approach you can make is live for the Lord, stay close to Him, try to win people to Him, and leave the politics to everybody else. But it's not necessarily the case that when you live in a society where you actually do have the opportunity to make a difference, should you just stay out of it? If you can protect some of the helpless, if you can help some of those in need, if you can stand up for what's right, and even though it's not going to be heaven on earth, if you can make your society just a little better, well, if you love your neighbor, make it a little better. A third uh, approach that some Christians have is, let's take back our country, let's run it the way it ought to be run, and we're going to be the ones doing it. So you wield political power, and you're going to make those stinking non-believers behave like Christians whether they want to or not. Take that. If we get 51% of the vote, you're going to do what we say. Well, the... <laughs> That has its problems. It'll, it'll have the effect of turning people very sharply against the gospel, um, against the Christian faith, if you did manage to gain that kind of power. Um, and let's be realistic. Real biblical Christianity doesn't have that kind of numbers and that kind of power in the society that we're in today. It just doesn't face it and deal with it. Um, and if it did have that kind of power, then you have the situation like they had with the Emperor Constantine, as they've had throughout history. It is not always paradise when a Christian bully is running the show either, okay? So we, there, there are some missteps to avoid. One is this social gospel that we're just going to turn Christianity into politics. Or we're going to avoid it totally or we're going to really be domineering and forcing other Christians to behave. And as I mentioned in a previous message, we need realism. The system's human. It's not divine. Don't try to think that your socio-political engagement is going to make everything good. And yet the system is needed and helpful, so don't try to just throw it all out and overthrow it. The system's worldly and wicked. Sometimes it's called the beast. Sometimes it's called Babel and the whore. Okay? The Bible doesn't always say the system is just peachy and wonderful. And yet it's needed at the same time as it's worldly and wicked. It's fragile and fleeting, so live as strangers here. Do not think that if only you got the right people in for the next couple minutes, you would now be living in paradise. Whatever system gets in, even if it's an improvement on the previous one, is going to pass away. And the system, it can't save souls, it can't purify people, it can't produce paradise. So keep all those things in mind at the same time, that doesn't mean stay out of political engagement entirely. 
And it means that you don't have to win everything that you wanted. It doesn't mean that on every issue it's all or nothing because you're a person of principle. It doesn't mean that when you're picking a candidate, it's all or nothing. Either it's going to be King Solomon and King David and Pericles and George Washington all wrapped into one, or it's going to be nobody because I will not compromise. I will vote for someone outstanding or I will not waste my vote on an inferior person. So when you're dealing with politics, you're dealing with possibilities. Okay, that's what you're dealing with. J.I. Packer says, compromise in politics means realistic readiness to settle for what one thinks to be less than ideal when it's all one can get at the moment. Whether that's legislation or whether that's the persons that are being offered as the choices in an election. When you're in politics or when you're debating with people, um, you may say, I believe in defending unborn children and I will not compromise. Now, you shouldn't compromise your conviction. But let's say you could pass legislation that would defend all unborn children after the first trimester. You could say, anybody who votes for that is a no-good rat and a compromiser because they're saying that any unborn child who hasn't made it to three months of gestation isn't worth protecting. Not necessarily. You might be saying, I'm trying to protect as many as I can, and I can't yet win the political clout to protect the others. So you take what you can get sometimes in political situations where something is better than nothing. Political compromise is not moral compromise. It is not doctrinal compromise. It's saying this is that messy realm of politics where the wicked often mingle with the righteous, where uh, different priorities are at work. And if you're living in something that engages a lot of different voices, this is about the best you can get at the moment. I wouldn't want to be a politician. Okay. I'm a lot better at this is right, this is wrong, that's that live for the Lord. And I think that as Christians, we need to keep seeking King Jesus and not trying to round off little corners about how we ought to live in holiness. That is a different thing than saying, and therefore we're going to be able to make the government do everything that is perfectly in line with the rule of Jesus Christ. Hey, he's coming again. It's going to happen. Until then, when you're involved in the give and take of politics, there will be choices that are much less than perfect but one still is less bad than the other, whether it's the persons you're choosing or the policies that you're choosing. So um, it, that does not mean, now I believe that wrong is right. It means that this is as far as we can get. Uh, as, as is sometimes said, politics is the art of the possible. You take what is possible at the moment, and you see if you can make a bigger difference as time goes by. So, where does, that, where does that leave us as Christian citizens today? Well, submit to the governing authorities. That means obey good laws and, and resist evil orders. That's what it's always meant. We must obey God rather than men when the orders are bad. Um, and even when the orders are bad, that doesn't mean we start a revolution. But it does mean that we don't obey bad orders. There have been dictatorships where you're supposed to inform on your fellow citizens. Now you see some of that coming back. You're supposed to squeal if a governor who is unauthorized, in Michigan, she wants you to tell on your neighbors if you see them doing something they're not supposed to be doing, like oh, having a party. Okay, just go away. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there, is, there are needed orders by government, but you do not go squealing on your neighbors to keep a governor happy. If you saw somebody get shot by your neighbor, then you should be a witness in court, but unjust laws, ignore them. Um, use your voice and your vote to protect life and liberty under law. It's hard to sort through all the different things that um, are issues in a particular election, but don't let go of the basic fundamental role of government, and that is to protect life and liberty under the law, and make sure that the people you choose are people who actually live under law. Those who tell you, if elected, I am going to change how the institutions of this country are, think very hard before pulling the lever 
for somebody who says, I'm going to change that whole system of checks and balances that has existed uh, for all these hundreds of years. So, use your voice and your vote to protect life and liberty under the law. If you're called into public service, do it. Okay, I'm not. Um, Doug Horn is. He can serve on the village board. Um, people who serve in the police can serve in that way. That's an arm of government. People who serve in the legal professions um, are involved in some ways in governance. And so don't, you don't, don't feel that that's kind of a dingy or, or murky or bad calling. That's one of the great callings that Christians can be involved in, in governance, in making a difference in the political realm. So if you have a calling and the ability and the aptitude for public service, go for it. Pray for officials, um, police, military, be prayerful. they got a hard job to do. It's easy to knock them, but they have a very challenging job. And even those who are not Christians, in, in the New Testament, none of these guys they were praying for were Christians at all. They were bad, a lot of them. And the call was pray for them because they're serving a function that God wants served. And in all of it, put your heavenly citizenship first. You're strangers and aliens here. So as these elections come and go, as these politics come and go, if there's something I've said today that, that rubbed your politics the wrong way, well, please um, pardon and overlook and forgive that because our love for one another in Christ matters more than our political positions. And whoever happens to win on Tuesday, I can tell you who already won. Um, Jesus Christ is on the throne. It's not going to be any of the politicians who win on Tuesday that are running the throne of the universe. So... Uh, be glad and rejoice. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Uh, let's stand and let's sing that song together.